My grandparents bought me this score of Beethoven's Piano Concertos when I was uh, seven years old. It was one of my first scores. And I remember flipping through the first concerto and coming to this passage where I could not figure out how you're supposed to play it. Because clearly it's written as if the right hand is going to be playing octaves. Now, at seven years old, I couldn't quite reach an octave yet, but even then I realized there's no way you can play it fast enough. It's supposed to go. And so I was thinking, well, maybe I can play it with two hands. But, oh no, wait, there's this key down here that I'm supposed to play with the left hand. So maybe I can start the scale with two hands and then jump down for that note and then jump back. But no, there's no way you could play that fast enough either. So I figured, oh, maybe the conductor has to come over and hit that low key for you while you do the scale. Or maybe you do it with your foot. And of course, I would listen to different pianists on CDs, because back in my day, that was how we listened to music on CDs. There was no YouTube. And I could never figure out how they were doing it, because it always came out so smooth. And finally, one day, I remember going to hear this concerto in concert, and I was so excited that I would finally get to see how it was done. Unfortunately, my seat did not have a good view of the keyboard, so I left that concert just as in the dark as I had been. I just did not know what a glissando was. Typically, a glissando is done where one hand is playing one note at a time, and you do this by dragging your thumb or some other appropriate appendage up and down the keyboard. If you do this too much, you can actually wear away your thumbnail, so be careful. Practice accordingly. But if you're doing octave glissandos, that's another matter entirely. It's important to keep in mind that Beethoven was writing for pianos that had a much lighter action than modern pianos. So at the time of writing, these things would have been much easier. There are two ways of doing this that I've seen demonstrated in master classes. The preferred way seems to be to tuck your thumb under your hand a little bit. Maybe you can see it better if I do it with my left hand. Tuck your thumb this way so that you can drag it in the same direction as your pinky. I can kind of do it with sixths and smaller intervals, but for those of us, myself included, whose hands aren't quite big enough, the other way to do it is to dip your hand low enough so that you can glide across the white keys with the underside of your thumb like that. Well, that's the way it's normally taught, but I believe I've found a better way of playing octave glissandos, and it uses Legos. You can get basically the same effect of dragging your finger up and down the keyboard by rolling a wheel. So I have this giant rubber tired wheel, which is nice because that way it doesn't uh, scratch the keyboard. So you just need something to hold it steady. So now I have this wheelbarrow-ish thing. Promising, right? So all we need is two of these things at the right distance apart. By a remarkable coincidence, one white key is just about three Lego bits wide, which means that an octave is going to be three times seven equals 21 bits. Oh, and can we just take a moment to talk about how silly it is that an octave, an eighth, is actually seven white keys apart, and a seventh is actually six keys apart, and so on? It's because when they say seventh or sixth or whatever, they're including both the top and the bottom note, whereas if you were measuring from the middle of one key to the middle of the other key, which is the only way that makes mathematical sense, an octave would be called a seventh. It's so silly, but we're stuck with these names. An octave is actually slightly narrower than 21 Lego bits, and if I wanted to be really picky, I would have to figure out some way of doing fractional Lego units. But fortunately for something like an octave glissando, the accuracy doesn't matter quite that much. So this works pretty well for playing a glissando once you're into the glissando, but what I found is that because these wheels are so large, when you put it down, you're liable to hit multiple keys at once. 
And you want the wheels to be this big, partly to minimize the lateral forces and partly so that it rides high enough that when you push it down, this thing doesn't scrape the keys. So to play this passage, I think what you have to do is first hit the octave with your left hand and then as silently as possible pick it up with your contraption. And then you probably have to do something similar down at the bottom. So this contraption works reasonably well for this passage, but what I want to try to do is make a version that will lend itself to this passage in the Waldstein Sonata, where Beethoven makes you do octave glissandos in both hands. Although people have discovered workarounds that don't involve glissandos, which are quite interesting. The first one depends upon the observation that because you've got a lot of pedal anyway, at no point do you actually need to play two octaves in a row in one hand. The notes are such that if you jump around enough, you can split it up like this. The other workaround is something that Vladimir Horowitz did. Now, Horowitz wasn't really a Beethoven guy. You think of him as doing more Chopin, Liszt, Rachmaninoff, that sort of music. But he did leave behind a recording of the Waldstein Sonata in which he does this. He gets rid of the pedal marking, he gets rid of the legato marking, and he just plays it like this. It's kind of an interesting effect if you're used to hearing it as a glissando but I really want to try to adapt this mechanism so that I can use it to play the Waldstein Sonata. And the trick is that when I come to the end of the glissando, I have to play chords, at least in the right hand. I want to be able to adapt this thing so that it will have a sleeve that I can stick my hand into and it will just be held there so that I can glide down the keyboard and then I'll be able to reach in with these two fingers and hit these extra notes. It doesn't matter so much in the left hand because the glissandos don't end in chords. So I'm going to keep this one for the left hand and make the new and improved version for the right hand. So I realized partway through building this that it would be even easier if I worked with it upside down so that I could use some of these slanted pieces to help make the sleeve to hold my hand in. By the way, those of you who want to try this yourself at home, be very careful that you don't drop any Legos into the piano anywhere, because the last thing you want is to have to call your piano technician over and have to explain to them what you were doing. I'm trying to make this thing be extra strong so that it doesn't fall apart while I'm using it. Okay, so the only downside I see to this approach is that I'm going to have to pause to grab these things off the music stand and that's going to disrupt the flow of the music. But I don't see a way around that. practice time, I'll get the hang of it. Actually, I prefer Vladimir Horowitz's solution. It's so unexpected. Especially if you're used to the original. Okay, what other pieces can we use this for? Well, of course, there's the uh, Franz Liszt Piano Concerto number no. 2, which has some glissandos at the end. Now, strictly speaking, this isn't an octave glissando because you can do it with two hands. 
whichever fingers you want. And if you don't want to do the glissando, he even gives you an osseo, which is just chords. But no one does that. Everyone does the glissando. So here, you would just have to have this handy, and then as you approach it, warn your audience to watch out. Anyway, that is how you play octave glissandos with Legos. To any pianists out there who have a large enough Lego collection, I highly recommend you try out this technique. It will change your life. And as for my fellow composers out there, I highly recommend that you avoid writing glissandos, whether single note or octaves. I did do one glissando in my Fear Elise video, and that was because I was trying to parody the Franz Liszt rhapsodies. <laughs> In general, never mind how awkward it is to play, pianists can definitely deal with it, but it's an incredibly cheesy effect. And unless you're trying to be cheesy, as I was at that moment in that video, if you want to do a flourish, there's probably a more imaginative way you can do a flourish with scales or arpeggios or something like that. For example, in the Beethoven First Concerto, this is what I probably would have done instead. <laughs> I think that works just as well. Sorry, Beethoven. Mm -hmm.